Hello, this is Andrew Roberts, and welcome back to the Secrets of Statecraft podcast. On the occasion of Queen Elizabeth II's Jubilee, I spoke to Robert Hardman, the best of her biographers, and a star reporter on the Daily Mail. We discussed the Queen's 70 years on the throne and her unparalleled use of soft power statecraft. Robert Hardman, first of all, Congratulations on the uh, great success of your book, Queen of Our Times, which I see is in the bestseller list. I wonder whether Thank or you. not you, <laughs> I wonder whether or not you can tell us about uh, draw a picture of what um, Britain and the world was like in 1952 when Her Majesty the Queen came to the throne. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and. When we look back to 52, we're looking at, frankly, a, a, another age. Um, we're looking at a largely uh, monocultural society in Britain. We're looking at a time of rationing. Uh, Britain is still uh, in the throes of the Korean War. Uh, we haven't really even begun the jet age, let alone the space age. And half the countries that exist on Earth today don't exist in their present form. So since that time, half the nations on earth have acquired their constitutions, their flags, their anthems. Uh, everything that we would come to regard as normal today from owning a car, from being able to pop out to the shops, from turning on the television, none of that really applies in 1952. Um, this is a world that is still, certainly in Britain at any rate, um, in, in, in a sort of post-war setting. There are still bomb sites, there are still as I say, rationing, and people are uh, very much, um, very much getting over um, the the complete upheaval of the Second World War. And when one thinks, therefore, of the world today, seventy years later, totally different in every way, apart from we have the same monarch. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty. Uh, what are the precedents for 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 a reign as long as this one? Uh, well, there really aren't very many. I mean, at the moment, the Queen is by far and away the longest serving head of state in the world today. She's the longest reigning, longest lived monarch in British history. She's not quite um, the longest reigning monarch of all time. She's got to carry on, as I'm sure she will, until May 2024, um, when she will finally overtake Louis XIV of France, who had a, <laughs> had a, had a head start by... Um, coming to the throne as a little boy. Uh, she, of course, came to the throne as a 25-year-old mother of two. Uh, but uh, I, I have every confidence that we'll be marking that that particular moment in due course. Not that she will. She doesn't really get competitive about these things, but the rest of us certainly do. <laughs> um, now, this uh, podcast of mine is about the secrets of statecraft, and it strikes me that the Queen does exercise tremendous soft power for Britain, uh, doesn't she? There are. We're going to be talking about various occasions in her reign where she's helped um, the, Britain and the Commonwealth along just by her essentially her uh, authority and her and her presence, um, despite of course having constitutionally to stay out of politics. So how do you feel? Uh, do you feel that her um, uh, approach to her constitutional duties has changed at all um, from 1952 to today? Uh, I, I don't think the uh, the overall approach is any different. It's it's uh, very much it's, it's very correct. She she learnt statecraft. She learnt her history um, through through her father. It's one of the things she was taught as a uh, as, as a young girl by a, a very eminent Eton Beak called Henry Martin. She was sort of raised on the central tenets of constitutional monarchy, which are that. Um, you know, the, the, the government of the day, the elected government will do the governing, um, but you are there as, as, as uh, above politics to, to essentially to see fair play, to, to uphold um, democracy. Um, and, and that's been really her sort of her, her guiding light. And I mean, you talk about soft power. Absolutely. She is the quintessence of soft power, I think. I spoke to Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University. Um, while I was writing my book, that the man who originally devised the concept of soft power, this idea of um, influence uh, and persuasion over brute force and coercion. Um, and I, I think she embodies that. She's embodied that right the way through her, her reign. I mean, today, yes, she's a, a very revered figure. Every world leader wants to meet her. 
um, and that's in part because of all the history she represents. But that was that was the same very early on in the reign. She she was this um, extraordinary figure who 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 represented uh, not just a, a great sort of swathe of history, but 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 also carried with her a, 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 this this sort of this this sense of um, of, of, of duty of service. Uh, and of authenticity. I don't think anyone's ever felt that the Queen is trying to pull a fast one. That there's, you know, that there's ever any any side being taken. She is um, utterly dependable, utterly reliable, and and that's that's really continues today as as it always has done. With regard to her soft power, um, she's been very influential with regard to the special relationship, hasn't she? Um, over the years, she's she's met a truly extraordinary number of presidents, for starters, hasn't she? Yes, she has met uh, 14 US presidents, uh, which uh, when I spoke to George W. Bush, um, he couldn't really think of anybody anywhere ever who's not just shaken hands with, but actually met, known 14 presidents. Um, she started with President Truman on her first trip to the US in 1951, uh, met every president since then, with the exception of Lyndon B. Johnson. But with the addition of President Hoover, who she actually met, he'd retired by then, but she met him on her 1957 state visit to the USA. Uh, so that in itself, that's that's a sort of level of experience that, that, that no one else can match. But it's not just a case of having these sort of memories of being able to say, oh, I've met more presidents than you. It's actually bringing to bear a, 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 a sense of what they were about. One of the things that particularly struck Barack Obama um, when he came on his state visit in 2011, he, he was just sort of blown away, as he put it, by her ability to uh, provide these sort of pen portraits of his predecessors, just to sort of remember um, what had been the big issues of the day, how they'd handled them. She's, She's very much interested in the people side of politics and, and what makes politicians tick. Um, and, and, and to be able to recount some of that, just to recount the, 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 the sort of the, the mood of the moment when Kennedy came to dinner in 61, or when Nixon came to lunch in 68, or lunch again in 1970, or, or, or dancing with Gerald Ford, marking the bicentenary of American independence in 1976. You know, these are, these are moments, I and mean, nobody else can really conjure up these, 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 these memories. But at the same time, she's not a sentimentalist. Um, she very much lives in the present. And I think all the, all the leaders that have met her have found her um, refreshingly human, um, but, but, but also very, very willing to sort of share, to, 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 to go back over some of these memories, but to put them in a modern context. It's not just about wallowing in nostalgia and saying, oh, I had a lovely time then. It, it's about, you know, giving it some sort of modern application as well. Which um, presidents do you think she liked the most? <laughs> It's, oh, it's a tricky and one. And dislike the most as well, go on. <laughs> Prime Minister's actually very, very hard. I mean, the only one she ever used by, called by his first name was Winston. And I think her least favourite Prime Minister is probably Edward Heath, um, for various reasons we can go into later. But uh, presidents wise, um, I think there was a real friendship um, with Ronald Reagan, uh, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, um, uh, as, as actually was replicated at, at a political level, obviously, um, with Margaret Thatcher. Um, but, but Reagan was someone who um, was was relatively close in age to her, um, but who who really sort of came to to Britain's side at a time when it really mattered. In the, in the early eighties, um, her nation, her armed forces, and of course her son Prince Andrew were all at war in the South Atlantic, and and Reagan turned out to be a very uh, a very staunch ally and came to stay at Windsor right at the, just towards the end of the Falklands crisis. And it was a huge morale booster for Britain and for the Queen personally. And, and she loved having the Reagans. And of course, that celebrated uh, sight of, of the two uh, heads of state riding out on horseback out of Windsor Castle across the park. I mean, it's one of the kind of defining images, I think, of her reign, certainly of the 80s. Um, and, and, and what I found in the course of research in my book was, I mean, obviously, this meant an, a great deal to Britain, to the Queen, to the government, to have the, the US president uh, writing, spending a whole morning on horseback with the Queen and clearly loving it. But what's fascinating is, is uh, having got my hands on some of the classified files um, after, after quite a lot of um, freedom of information requests here in the UK um, and, and reading up 
on, on quite how important this moment was to Reagan as well. I mean, he was on his first big European tour. This mattered a lot. He was going to a NATO summit, a G7 summit. He was going for an audience with the Pope. He was going to be make a historic joint address to the Houses of Parliament. But as, as the diplomatic cables make very clear, the thing that mattered to him far more than anything else was his ride with the Queen. You know, what <laughs> horse was he going to be on? What sort of saddle? What ought he to wear? Uh, and he loved it. Um, and that that sort of soft power, that is a level of influence that you and, just can't and didn't, you can't uh, buy. And, and 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 that leads to this sort of friendship with Reagan. And didn't he didn't he invited her to his ranch? That's right, well. exactly. So the following year, he he knows that the Queen's always wanted to go to Hollywood. And of course, when you're head of state, you go on state visits, you always have to go to Washington. And he sort of cut through this and said, no, 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 you're going to come and stay with me in California. And we're going to see Hollywood. And the Queen's absolutely thrilled. It's, you know, finally, she's going to get to see Hollywood. She's always loved, uh, you know, the movies. She's always loved musicals. And, uh, and, and so the following year, it's not called a state visit. It's called an official visit. Um, and so she and Prince Philip fly out to, to California and, and, and the royal yachts there as well. Um, it's the most dreadful weather. I mean, the, the whole itinerary is, is sort of thrown into turmoil by the, this, the, these sort of endless downpours. But the Queen doesn't really care. She's having a lovely time. She's in California. And, uh, and Reagan lays on this huge lunch in Hollywood. And, and then, as you say, invites her up to the ranch. And she's the only uh, world leader who is, gets that sort of treatment, who actually gets invited you know, into the sort of inner, inner sanctum. And it's just Ron and Nancy and, and the Queen and Prince Philip. Uh, and they're 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 there, and they you know they're, they're they're chopping wood and having a barbecue, and 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 as again you read the diplomatic cables on this, I mean the Foreign Office can scarcely believe their luck. It's sort of you know this is a level of access and influence that no prime minister could ever hope to achieve, and it's being achieved by the Queen. This is absolutely the quintessence of soft power, and that friendship carries on, and it and it's followed in very short order by by George. Bush Sr., who's an exact contemporary of the Queen. Barbara Bush is an exact contemporary of the Queen and Prince Philip. Both George Bush and Prince Philip served in the Far East in the war. They've got very similar experiences. So again, that, that sort of carries on. And you do find at periods, I think, through the, the so-called special relationship, there are times when it's not terribly special. I mean, in the in the in the in the late sixties, you know, you you had that you had you had Britain and Vietnam, uh, sorry, Britain and, and the USA at loggerheads over the Vietnam War. Um, during, say, the uh, John Major Bill Clinton era, there was a lot. There were a lot of strains and stresses between um, Downing Street and the White House. And at those moments, it, it really is. It's the it's 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 the sort of the palace White House axis that is sort of keeping the special relationship alive. Um, uh, there was President no... Obama wasn't terribly pro-British, was he? At the beginning? No, of the absolutely. Presidency. I mean, you know, when I spoke to David Cameron about this, he said, you know, they they were all very worried at the start of the Obama presidency. It was like, well, what 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 do we know about you know what 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 does what what does Obama think about Britain? And someone pipes up and says, well. He, his luggage once got lost at Heathrow, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have very happy memories. That doesn't put him in the minority. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and on a rather more serious note, you know, the British at one point, you know, allegedly tortured his grandfather in Kenya. I mean, you know, he, this, is a, this is a president who has very little reason to have any sort of uh, uh, sentimental ideas about Britain. Um, and and uh, to start with, as as, as uh, Gordon Brown discovered, you know, it, it, he he was not particularly well disposed towards this country. However, um, he soon got to know the Queen and Prince Philip, and he, he won, on one of his um, earlier presidential visits to to Britain for a um, for, for for a NATO summit and then a G20 summit. He, uh, he he came to London and, and the Queen had, had a reception as she always does for visiting world leaders and 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 they 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 met and they kind of hit it off um, and and on subsequent visits um, uh, the Queen would always be there when the Queen discovered that uh, Michelle Obama was coming through London with her daughters on a private visit she said well come round come round to the palace for tea and she laid on a little carriage ride around the garden for Michelle Obama. And Michelle Obama's mother, in fact, as well, and, and, and the daughters. And I mean, they absolutely loved it. You know, as, as one of Obama's aides said to me, you know, there weren't, there weren't many things um, that the Obama family had on their bucket list, but that really was one of them. And so this, this sort of personal I, a friendship is probably not too strong a word. I think it was a friendship with Obama. This, this, this began and, it, and it, was, it was really cemented in that 2011 state visit um, just after 
the royal wedding of William and Kate. And uh, and and again, in, in in the course of research in my book, I spoke to the man who organised that visit, Ben Rhodes, Obama's senior speechwriter and, and senior aide, who just said, you know, he was completely captivated by this. It was a sort of bizarre evening at the palace where where Obama was enjoying himself so much he wouldn't go to bed. And at one point, the Queen uh, went up to George Osborne and said, look, excuse me, do you th- could you ask the President to go to bed? Because it is bedtime. Poor George Osborne sort of said, oh, OK, I'll try, ma'am. Um, went to sort of spoke to the private secretary who gently nudged um, the Obamas off to their, their, their quarters in the Belgian suite. And, and as Ben Rhodes said, Obama just wanted to sort of sit up and talk about it. He was sitting there. They were meant to be working on their speech. And Obama was just sort of reflecting on this extraordinary evening um, and, and, and just, you know, what a, what a wonderful time he'd had with the Queen and, and all her memories. And he reflected on, uh, at, at one point, uh, uh, what, 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 one, of the, one of the aides in the room said, you know, uh, um, you know do, do, do we think sort of, you know, Britain, the British Empire, it's all a bit over, isn't it? As they looked at the sort of jaded uh, Victorian decor and, and Obama said, uh, I'm not sure about that. Did you see the bling on the Queen? Um, and <laughs> <you've been> taken <laughs> by, by the jewellery. Uh, and, and, and there was a sort of comic moment again there was a knock on the door it was a it was a footman to say i'm very sorry mr president um but there's a mouse and obama said don't tell the first lady she hates mice um so you have this sort of comic moment of this sort of mouse hunt going on in the in the guest suite one you know in the next door room while michelle michelle obama's sort of going to bed and there's the president and the footman trying to get rid of this mouse and you, in this sort of bizarre setup this 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 elderly palace where there is it's the only only quarters Obama ever stayed in which didn't even have an ensuite bathroom um you know all in all um it was not what you might expect to be a recipe for a sort of great encounter and yet he absolutely loved it and a few years later um after many subsequent meetings with the queen he he, he famously made a speech at the uh, funeral of Shimon Peres uh, where he 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 Basically, it was a sort of essay on the on 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 what constitutes great leadership, uh, and he singled out two uh, great examples of post-war leadership that had inspired him, and one was Nelson Mandela, and the other was the Queen. And again, it goes back to my point: that is soft power. And the Queen uh, got on very well with Nelson Mandela as well, didn't they? The Queen, yeah, the Queen and Mandela was was that was a genuine friendship. Again, two people of fairly similar age. Uh, and and the Queen, of course, everybody knows how devoted she was to her Commonwealth and still is. Um, and and Mandela was as well. And Mandela always appreciated the role that the Commonwealth had played in, in being very much at the vanguard of fighting um, apartheid. Uh, and the Queen was immensely touched that the very first executive, major executive decision by Nelson Mandela on being elected as, as, as president in 1994 was to reattach South Africa to the Commonwealth. She was thrilled by that. Um, and uh, the following year, she made her, her historic state visit to South Africa. She'd always refused to go anywhere near it during the apartheid years. Uh, and now at last she could go back. She hadn't been back there since, um, since that great epic um, trip with her father in 1947, where she'd made that famous speech, declaring that the whole of her life, whether it be long or short, would be devoted to, to the Commonwealth, to, to the imperial family, as it was called then. And, uh, and and so there she is going back after all these years and there on the quayside, hand outstretched is Mandela. I was there at the time, I was lucky enough to be reporting on that. And it just was one of those electric moments as she mm-hmm. came down the, the, the gangplank of Britannia and there was, was, was Mandela, you know, saying, oh, your majesty. And, and the smile on her face was just something else. And, and, and that trip was, was, she definitely regarded that as one of the high points of her reign. And after that, um, they were, yeah, they were, they, were, they were genuinely good friends. And he came on a state visit to Britain a year later. He was the only world leader, non-royal world leader, who was allowed to call her Elizabeth and get away with it. Um, everyone <laughs> else, there would have been a sort of media sort of protocol seizure if anyone else had tried that. Uh, but but Nelson Mandela, he could just he could do whatever he liked. Um, she absolutely she thought he was marvelous. He thought the same. Um, and I over the years I sort of come across all sorts of funny encounters between them. She stayed in touch with him long after he retired. If he was ever coming through London, she'd insist that he he drop round. You know, one occasion he found himself sort of discussing a, 
uh, Prince Harry's O-level paper, GCSE papers. Which you know, they're very difficult, these exams, and the sort of two of them are sitting there discussing it. On another occasion, he came in and went, oh, Elizabeth, you've lost weight, which point half the half the sort of the private secretary said, oh my God, did he just say that? And of course, she didn't care. It was Nelson. You know? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was another, that was another real genuine, uh, um, you know, friendship. And because I think at, at, at the heart of it, and Obama made, made this point in his speech, they're, they're very similar characters. They, they're, they're understated. They, they can appreciate how a, a small gesture can, can go a long way. Um, they're they're quite they're calm people. They they don't get they don't get angry. They don't overreact, um, and and they they're authentic. I mean, they are absolutely they they are two characters uh, of whom people knew what they were getting, um, and and that that I think is is increasingly rare in 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 a in an age of of um, fairly febrile politics. Tell us about the um, the world leaders she hasn't got on with who are the ones that she she didn't like yes uh i mean there are there are there, there are a few who who i think she just sort of found them um rather rather badly behaved and then some who she genuinely uh just found utterly objectionable i think probably very high on that list is um nikolai ceausescu of romania who came on arguably the worst state visit ever in uh, 1978 he'd been invited by the labor government of Jim Callaghan um, to, uh, well, in fact, it was his predecessor, Harold Wilson, that issued the invitation. Uh, and the whole idea was that Ceausescu was going to come to Britain and sign a contract to buy lots of British civilian aircraft. Um, and that, that, was, that was the deal. Uh, you know, you can come and stay with the Queen, but you've got to buy these aircraft. Um, and so uh, the Queen was sort of forced to accommodate this, this tyrant. Uh, and you again, you read all the, the diplomatic papers. Everyone was very well aware of how thoroughly unpleasant Ceausescu was, how he persecuted minorities, how, um, uh, uh, and at the same time, how how his wife uh, Elena was this complete fraud who had, uh, had uh, uh, believed herself to be a sort of world class chemist, um, and wherever she went, expected to be handed um, academic honours of great distinction. Um, and in the run up to the state visit, there was a sort of panic at the Foreign Office because uh, Madame Ceausescu was very much expecting to be given an honorary doctorate or two and an honorary professorship. And no British universities would oblige. They, they tried Oxford and Cambridge, no joy. They went right the way through the, the academic spectrum. Um, and nobody would play ball because they all knew, A, how ghastly the Ceausescus were and B, what a fraud Mrs Ceausescu was. But finally, at the end of the day, the Polytechnic of Central London uh, <laughs> and said, "All right, we'll give her an honorary doctorate." Um, uh, so, at which point, um, that that became a central part of the visit. But they were they were paranoid, um, chippy, difficult. Um, in the days before their arrival, uh, uh, the Queen actually took a call from Giscard d'Estaing of France, who warned her because the Ceausescus had recently been to stay in Paris. And he said, you know, they absolutely destroyed their, their quarters. Anything that moved, they stole, they took back with them. Um, but they'd been gouging out holes in the wall, looking for bugs um, and, and, and bugging devices. And um, so, so the queen quickly said to the master of the household, right, anything that moves, get it out quick. You know, we, we don't, want any, don't want to start losing <laughs> sort of precious china or, or vases. Um, actually, Ceausescu behaved very well. He was completely overawed by the Queen, um, but he was very distrusting of everything around him. He brought all his clothes in hermetically sealed plastic cases because he was convinced palace staff might try and poison his um, his clothing. And uh, and 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 he was he was just a sort of sullen, <clears throat> gloomy presence. He didn't really talk to anyone inside the building because again he thought he was being bugged. So he conducted all his conversations with his wife and his aides in the garden. Only known uh, occasion where the Queen actually hid in her own garden. She was out walking the corgis one afternoon uh, and saw the, the, the Ceausescus coming around the corner and just thought, oh, can't bear it. So she just hid behind a bush and waited for the <laughs> people to go. Um, I know that's true because she told one of my interviewees who, uh, over lunch. Um, so, yes, Ceausescu, definitely a wrong one. Uh, she she didn't like Idi Amin very much. She was rather fascinated by him um, it, when he became a um, he, he he took charge of uh, Uganda in a coup, um, but uh, and then insisted on on coming to London. And initially, the British government were quite keen to uh, to, to get him on side. 
um, but rapidly realized they were dealing with a sort of psychopath. Um, and it's one of the few occasions actually where the Queen managed to avert a small war over lunch because he had lunch with the Queen and confided in her that he, uh, he was planning to um, invade Tanzania in order to uh, um, claim a land corridor through to the Indian Ocean. And the Queen happened to be very friendly with um, Joseph Nereri, the, the president of Tanzania, uh, and thought, well, I don't, really don't think um, uh, President Nereri is going to be very happy about being invaded. Uh, so as soon as lunch was over, she contacted, um, told her private secretary to ring up the foreign secretary and say, you know, uh, Armin is about to invade Tanzania, to which the foreign secretary said, oh, well, that's very helpful because he's just on his way to see me now and he wants some more armoured cars. Um, so they managed, to, <laughs> uh, they managed to block that on sale. But, you know, all through all through the rain, um, there's just been this... See, in a sense, sorry to butt sorry, in, yeah. uh, Bob, but... In a sense, you know, that isn't soft power. That's that's genuine power, isn't it? To be able to avert a war. It's uh, it, indeed it is. I mean, I, I, it's it's probably a slight breach of the what I was saying earlier. The Queen's immensely trustworthy, and you can confide in her. I think you can confide most things in her. But if you are planning to invade one of her friends, countries, <laughs> then she might just have a word with someone. <laughs> Tell us about the triumph of her uh, trip to. Ireland in 2011 because that really was a historic occasion wasn't yeah, it yeah that, that, to, that uh, is... to make it to, to peacemaking and soft power and statecraft and so on absolutely that that again uh, and and you know that's that's really relatively recently I mean that by by this point um you know with the, the, the queen is well into her ninth decade um a time when when almost every other world leader would would long since have retired uh, and she's always wanted to visit her nearest neighbour. It is extraordinary that at that point she'd been right the way around the world, travelled further than any monarch ever, but she'd never been to the only country that shares a land border with the United Kingdom, uh, and she'd always wanted to. And it, it was a hundred years since a British monarch had set foot um, in, 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 in what we now call the Republic of Ireland. And, uh, and, and, and it was sort of setting a seal, really, on, on a sort of peace process that had been underway for some years. Uh, and, and it was it was the final um, imprimatur, if you like, of of normality in, in, in the island of Ireland. Um, and, and she was extremely keen to go. Uh, what I discovered interviewing the British ambassador at the time was that the, the Irish government were talking about possibly a two day trip for the Queen. Um, and it was one of those rare occasions where the palace were actually pushing to, 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 to make her do more. She wanted to be there for four days. So it, it turned into a much longer trip because she really wanted to see her and meet as many people as she could. And um, it, it had a sort of magic about it because, you know, here, here was, I mean, the, the, the story of sort of UK Irish politics. It's, it's a long and turbulent and often bloody one. Um, and and the, the troubles of Northern Ireland, we don't even need to go into here. I mean, decades of, of just misery. And finally, uh, here comes this, this figure who really, um, I think, does more to promote um, UK-Irish cohesion, harmony, whatever you want to call it, um, in the space of a few days uh, than, than politicians have achieved in decades, because... Um, because she she represents so much, and, it, and and so much of it was done without even without even speaking. I mean, on the first day um, she arrived, I just remember the moment where where the, the plane came to a halt on the runway and the, the door opened, and there she was in emerald green. And the uh, and one of the Irish press uh, court standing next to me turned around and said, "Well, we can all go home now. She's won." You know, she was just there. In <laughs> green. She, she was in green, and it was great. And, and later that day, she went to the uh, the the monument in Dublin. The the, the it's it's a sort of sacred monument to the the, the, the sort of the, the, the martyrs of the of the independence movement. Basically, people who lost their lives fighting the British crown. And she laid a wreath, and she bowed, and and you know without saying a word, the sight of the monarch who bows to no one, nodding, bowing her her recognition, her respect at the sacred place, every bit as sacred as, as the cenotaph is on Whitehall. You know, these things carry enormous weight. Um, and then at the, the state banquet the following evening at Dublin Castle, um, she prefaced her speech with a, with a, a few words of, 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 of Gaelic, but, you know, they've been very well practiced and, and, and no one was expecting them. Um, and they just, they, they, they had this sort of, um, I suppose you could call it a sort of healing effect almost instantly and, 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 and lots of other little touches. I mean, her, 
her, her, her Angela Kelly, who's in charge her dresser, who's in charge of her wardrobe, had, had gone to a lot of trouble sewing 1,091 uh, crystal shamrocks under her ball gown. Um, no one made a point of this, they were just there. But this sort of thing gets picked up, you know, this is, this is sort of statecraft at a, at a, at a minute level. Um, but, but, but as I say, these, these small gestures go a long way and it just created this, this mood that um, I, I would regard as the sort of high point. It's, 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 we, we, it's gone backwards, obviously, since Brexit. Um, at that period, for several years, um, you know, London and Dublin were as close as they had ever been. And uh, one sees it also, doesn't one, at the time of 9-11, when uh, the Queen made, uh, or at least gave a message to the British ambassador in, uh, in Washington about, about what to say about 9-11. Um, there was the particular point of, of having the, st the Stars and uh, Star Spangled Banner played at uh, Buckingham Palace, and then that extraordinary phrase, um, grief is the price we pay for love, which I think is one of the most powerful things that she's mm. ever said. Uh, it, it was a great line, and it's one, it's, it's one of the most quoted uh, lines now at, at, uh, at, at funerals, for example, and on bereavement cards. Um, but no, she was absolutely, uh, she was mortified. She, she sat at Balmoral watching 9-11 unfold um, and, and, and immediately wanted to, you know, to do something. Um, and, and, and made it very clear that the, 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 the guard change at, uh, at the palace the next day was, was, was going to, 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 to reflect that. I mean, you had this great sense of togetherness. I mean, that moment where Tony Blair, you know, well, the, all the aircraft in the world are grounded, but Blair gets on a plane and flies to Washington to, to be in Congress uh, for, for the presidential address. That's a powerful moment. George Bush was recounting this to me, but he, you know, talked about how that was a great moment. But so too um, was the Queen's very obvious um, empathy with the American people, um, and uh, you know, subsequent invitations for um, U.S. forces and, and and those involved in in 9/11 to 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 come to Britain to to mark um, uh, memorial services in 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 the U.K. Um, two years later, she welcomed George Bush on a on on what was actually the first full ceremonial state visit for a U.S. president um, to the United Kingdom. So yes, I mean again, in, in in a time of crisis, she's been a very loyal ally. And she goes on holiday there, doesn't she, to America? Yeah, yeah, she doesn't not she doesn't really go on holiday anywhere very often. Um, you can count probably on 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 the fingers of two hands the number of foreign holidays she's had. Um, and they have all been, um, with a, a couple of exceptions, they've been to America. She, she used to love going, and particularly in the 80s, um, she would go on, um, on what Prince Philip used to call her horse trips. Um, and she'd just go and look at, uh, at ranches uh, in Kentucky and, 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 and Wyoming. And she liked to just uh, go and catch up with, with, with the sort of the horse racing um, uh, community in the US, um, very, um, always had a lifelong interest, as we know, in, 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 in racing, in horses. Um, and and the, the were, there were a lot of sort of overlaps there. Um, you know, she'd be looking for new bloodlines. I mean, it wouldn't just be a sort of put your feet up holiday. It was very much a sort of working holiday, but, but, but looking at horses. But I, other than America, all our holidays would be spent in the Scottish, uh, Scottish Highlands. But uh, there was something always very uh, important to her about the transatlantic relationship and I think it goes right back to the Second World War. I think when you've grown up around a monarch who feels at any minute his country is going to be invaded, his empire is going to implode, that he himself is going to be killed, he's been warned that there are enemy paratroopers on their way to kidnap his daughters, you know, this, this, this absolute apocalyptic sense of doom and then suddenly America comes into the war and there is this sense that all will be well. This this sort of redemptive um, feeling of this this great ally is is here. I think it has a profound effect. It certainly did on the royal family. I think that that sort of underpinned um, her love of well, really, of all things American. I mean, uh, uh, soon straight after the war, um, Oklahoma came to London, and she absolutely loved this sort of. This was so exciting. This this this, <laughs> this, this Broadway musical. Um, she went to see it dozens of times. Uh, you know, it's, it became one of the 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 the, the song people would say were in love. It became her sort of her her favorite tune. 
Um, she, she's, it's often been said she was never, never a huge fan of what some call high culture. She's never a great fan of opera or ballet, but she, she always loved a good, a good Hollywood hit. <laughs> now she's never given an interview, has she? How important do you think that is to her, uh, her ability to retain a sense of mystique? I think her, uh, her mystique is, is one of her great attributes. It's the fact that here we are well into her 10th decade and we're all asking the question that we've always asked, which is what she really like. And the answer is we don't really know because she won't really tell us. And good for her, you know, I mean, as, 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 a, as a biographer, as a journalist, of course, I'd love to sit down and have an interview with her and, 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 and hear what she really thought about all these, these leaders she's met, all these crises she's handled. Uh, but that's not her way. Um, it's it's different for younger generations. Every generation has to move with the times. I mean, previous monarchs would have been absolutely aghast at the very idea of letting TV cameras into the palace, for example. That's something she has done. Um, but she's she's kept her thoughts to herself, and I think it has served her well, particularly when you look at how how long her reign has been. She's the first monarch in our history who's come to the throne in the expectation not that they will uh, consolidate power and make Britain bigger and better and stronger, but in the expectation that she will manage decline. Um, she will hand territory back. She will uh, wave goodbye to all these colonies, but with a smile and a handshake. And, uh, and, and, and I think that the, the Commonwealth, um, even if it is a slightly dated organization now, and it's not not as important as it once was. I think it still is um, emblematic of the way she has the, the transformative way that she has taken what was a, 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 a an old imperial power very much on 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 a downward um, trajectory, um, and 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 given it a new lease of life and and made Britain a sort of the strong, confident country it is today. And the and the Commonwealth is growing, isn't it? Even countries that were not in the empire. Mm. Yeah, this year, 2022, the Commonwealth will be meeting in Rwanda, which was never part of the British Empire, um, ha had a very unhappy time as part of the Belgian Empire, but um, was very keen to join the, the Commonwealth. Um, uh, at the moment, there is a waiting list, and I think top of the queue currently is Angola, which was a Portuguese colony, Mozambique, now a Commonwealth nation, that was a Portuguese colony. So a lot of these places can see the advantages, and it's not about some sort of dewy-eyed sentimental um, attachment to, to, to the royal family. It's very much a sense that um, this is an organization that, that operates, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty formidable network. These are all countries, um, largely, uh, with, with, which have a shared language, a shared way of doing things, a shared legal code, um, and, and have this extraordinary complex web of, of civil societies. Um, that, that, that help each other all the time. I mean, at one level, there's a political level. Every two years, the, 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 the prime ministers get together and, and, and have their meeting. But actually, the day-to-day the, the -day work of the Commonwealth is just done by this, this endless uh, group of, of, of Commonwealth associations covering literally everything from tax keeping to the police to parliamentary associations. There's even a, I think the one with the longest name is the Commonwealth Association of Pediatric Gastroenterologists. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a Commonwealth Association of Dentists. I mean, if you're a small nation, and you're trying to find your way, you're trying to become an autonomous, free, new democracy, and you're trying to work out how do I do this? How do I do that? You've just got this network you can call on, and it's called the Commonwealth. Tell us about the time that she essentially held the Commonwealth together uh, at the Lusaka summit. Yes, she. There have been a number of occasions, I think, where the Commonwealth came very close to collapse, uh, largely to do with disagreements over Southern Africa, um, latterly over apartheid and sanctions uh, in South Africa. But before that, in 1979, the big issue was what's going to happen to Rhodesia. Rhodesia is then um, still a British colony, but the uh, white British. Uh, well, they're not British, they're, they've, they've declared independence. They, they've, they've unilaterally uh, set themselves up as a nation, but it's uh, a, 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 a sort of a white supremacist nation. The, 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 the black majority have no vote. Um, and, uh, and, and Britain can do nothing about this uh, unless it decides it's going to wade in and, with armed force. That's not going to happen. It's a very tense situation. There is a sort of civil war, it's known as the Bush War, raging. 
um, between largely between the the the, the, the white minority um, and and uh, the black majority, two large guerrilla armies. It's getting particularly bloody. Thousands of people have been killed on either side, and the Commonwealth finally decides we've got to do something about this. Um, and so they come together uh, for their their meeting in 1979 in Zambia, which happens to be just over the border from uh, from Rhodesia, um, and. Uh, there is there are big stresses because you've got um, the the essentially the the African nations are very keen um, that that Rhodesia is 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 finished and that um, that a new country a black majority rule um, takes place um, and yet you've got um, you've got some of the uh, older Commonwealth nations, notably um, Britain and New Zealand, that are trying to find a sort of halfway house. They, the, 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 Mrs. Thatcher has got a lot on her plate. She's only just become prime minister, but she's not particularly convinced um, that these guerrilla forces, one backed by the Soviets, one backed by the Chinese, are necessarily the best way forward um, for, for a new Rhodesia. Um, and things are getting quite stressful uh, ahead of the summit. And it gets to the point where the president, the host of the summit, President Kaunda, is about to make a speech in which he's he's going to just explode with rage about Mrs. Thatcher and say all sorts of things, uh, very angry, heated things about Mrs. Thatcher, which are just going to derail the summit. Um, and the British Foreign Office find out about this. They let the Queen know. And the Queen personally intervenes and says to Kaunda, look, don't make the speech. It's, it's, it's not going to achieve what you want. Just don't make it. Um, let's try uh, consensus rather than confrontation. Um, and we know that because her private secretary inserted a memo to that effect into the official account of the tour afterwards. And it had a, a, a remarkable result. A consensus was achieved. Mrs. Thatcher came around to the idea of the, what became the Lancaster House talks that in, led to um, the end of Rhodesia and the creation of modern Zimbabwe. And you can point very closely, very clearly, there's no question about this, you know, the Queen played a, a significant, not, not, not a determining, but certainly a significant part in the process that led to the transition from uh, Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. And that process, it could well be argued in turn, was what ultimately led to the dismantling of the apartheid regime over the border in South Africa. Robert Harbin, you've said that uh, we don't really know what she's like, but it strikes me that the best way to find out, the closest we're ever going to actually come to finding out what she's really like, is by reading your wonderful book, uh, Queen of Our Times, The Life of Elizabeth II. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much, Andrew. I've greatly enjoyed it. I'd like to thank Robert Hardman for joining us for that conversation about the Queen on the occasion of her jubilee. Join me for the next podcast, where I'll be having a frank and fascinating conversation with former Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. Until then, thank you for listening and goodbye. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.